This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game today. I am beard-free, both on my face and in partnership. Kyle Houck got the COVID. He's out. So, Uh, got a pretty good uh, pinch hitter for him here, Mr. Ryan Matheson from Glovebox. I'm sure nobody knows who that guy is. No, man. Unknown at this point, but uh, hey, appreciate you having me. Kyle's... Kyle might be in trouble. So yeah, he well look, you know, he he lives day to day with me. We'll see if he passes, you know, passes today in my favor. There you go. And then also, I mean, I feel like I got two guests, but you know, Ryan, you don't really count because you've already been on as a guest before. So you're you're guest host at this point. You'll actually show up in the artwork as a guest host. So. Yes, thank God, man. Wait till yes. you get the coffee mug, man. The coffee mug is the clutch. Support. <laughs> like, weekly. I've got my uh, mod advisor one right now. So yeah, we gave out the rest of those <laughs> yesterday. And our guest today is Mr. Zach Mefford from Zip Bonds, amongst other things. And we're just gonna shoot the breeze. Man, I can't even imagine the insure tech talk that's gonna come out of this conversation. It's insane. <laughs> well, I'm excited for it. I'm glad that we don't have a whole uh, agenda. Oh, it's never an agenda, man. If you if you ever listen to my podcast and think there is an agenda, then you're just as warped in the head as what I am because. We, it, we're gripping rip 100% of the time. We never play You can always anything. tell when podcasts have agendas. It's like, all right, now we're moving on to this segment, which is, you know, this. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, it's not my style, but hey, yeah. to each their own. Oh. No, I think that people, I think people by and large, that's why we do the shop talks on Friday, right? So we drop the yeah. shop talk because that's practical stuff. You know, very short, go do this and you can make a difference in your business. But the interview ones, you just got to see where the questions take you, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. At least I'm not Ryan Hanley. I warned you guys when I was going to start recording. When you go on Hanley's podcast, you can be talking to him for 20 minutes, and he's been recording the whole time, and you have no idea. <laughs> like our, I've experienced this for Like our pre-conversation, man. We had uh, Jason Cass on uh, Cease and Desist a couple weeks ago, and we could have talked to that guy for two and a half hours, man. We were just we were on a roll. But did you see? Uh, did you see that? I'm on, it's uh, Hanley and I for the uh, fantasy football and sure tech championship. Oh God, yes. <laughs> Yeah, see that, that at all? Awesome. <laughs> I love it. I think COVID just has to hit Northern New York, and I'll be fine because you know he's stacked with Bills players. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see what happens with the Bills, man. They're on the rise, though. I like the Bills right now. They finally got it together. It seems like it, man. I mean, they crushed that. Tampa when they were down here. I mean, we won the game, but we didn't deserve to win it. We destroyed them for the first half and then fell asleep. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be Pat's Bills in the AFC Championship. Maybe the Chiefs. I mean, the Chiefs are on the rise. We'll see. But I think the Bills will – I like Josh Allen, man. I, I was Selfishly, I want a Josh Allen impersonator in Denver. We have had a, we've had a brutal run. So. He, uh, yes, he was interesting <laughs> to watch him, man, because I don't really follow the Bills at all. So I didn't know much about him other than he racks up fantasy points like nobody's business, and I don't have him there either. But – to just watch him, how he played, and a dude that, that that's that big. He's just a he's a freak to be able to run the way that he is. He's like six five, six six, and he's he's built. Yeah, it's interesting to yeah. see the spectrum of quarterbacks right now. You've got uh, uh, the guy of Arizona. What's his name? Kyler Murray. He's what he can't yeah, be, he can't yep. be six foot five eleven. <laughs> no. He's like Doug Flutie, oh, but can run. Yeah, it's crazy yeah. to see the different types. Of well, as an Iowa State fan, we you know, obviously played against him in Oklahoma. So, I yeah. mean, having to see that guy run around and try to chase him and catch him, it's impossible. I was, I'm was i actually a little surprised to see how well he has done. 
with his with his size, but you know. Me as well. You got the San Diego quarterback. I mean, that guy is a pure pocket. If he gets out of the pocket, it's scary <laughs> to watch him run. It's like yeah. well, it's like Brady. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. You can literally hear an audible gasp in the stadium when yeah. Brady takes off the run. <laughs> yeah. it's, I mean, seriously. You can see the level of respect that Brady's earned, though, in the league because nobody hits him that hard. Yeah, they're not pounding and they, him. Uh-uh. And everybody helps him up. It's like you don't get that anywhere else. Yeah. Like, well, that's because played. Indomitian Sue plays for the Bucks. because if he didn't, then he would yeah. be that guy. Got it. Got it. Yeah, when right. he was in Detroit, man, game on. <laughs> that guy was na- – I bet he's nasty to his own grandmother at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> well, he was known as being a bit dirty yeah. for a while there. Oh. Like, <laughs> he absolutely yeah. was. Yeah. You, he, and that's, again, didn't he stomp on some guy's face? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he got suspended a yeah. couple times for, for whatever. Like, I draw the line at spitting, right? When you spit on other players, like Bart Scott did that and a couple other people. Yeah. Like, that, to me, that I'm going to probably go to jail if you spit on me. I'm or just, what about that magical, if, uh, like, taking your helmet off and hitting that uh, Pittsburgh backup quarterback last yeah. year? That was, was, that, uh, <laughs> that was Miles awesome. Garrett. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I'd like to see uh, Nanamik and Sue and uh, Richie Incognito, like, MMA fight. That's what I'd really like to see. Set that up. That would be nice. See those two guys. Yeah. I think <laughs> – I feel like there's a lot of uh, room for NFL dirty players in the UFC. Like, there's just room. For well, I mean, Greg Hardy's to... already there, so Hardy got rocked his yeah. last fight. I think everybody loved it, <laughs> especially his ex-wife or ex-girlfriend or whoever. I mean, is yeah. that why he's out of the NFL? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why he's out of the NFL. He's I mean, like it's... a lower-profile Ray Rice. Absolutely, just because it was on audio and on video. I mean, it's the only reason he's in the UFC. But yeah, he got rocked his last fight. It's amazing to me, man, that you got certain things that are just irrecoverable, right? And I'm, look, I realize I'm dancing on very dangerous ground when I say this, so please understand where it's coming from. I just don't understand how we can forgive some of the crap that we see happen. Yeah. And a guy like Ray Rice that makes a mistake, I'm not going to, I do not condone anything that he did. My God, it was on video and it was horrific to yeah. watch. Does he really deserve to lose his entire career over that? It's interesting how they, uh, separate things that that weren't on video right look at tyree kill and what he's allegedly done with his kids and wife and their girlfriend or whatever it is uh the running back for the browns as well he used to be on for cream hunt right cream hunt. Yep. yeah they're still in the well, league adrian peterson got in trouble for whacking his kid with a switch yeah but he didn't lose his whole career over it yeah it's it's an interesting i i, I don't know I, I i don't really want to jump on that grenade and say it, but like you watch that video with Ray it's Rice, horrible like I, but, I, but put him I in jail, like, like punish him criminally for it. It's well, like, yeah, agreed. But I mean, if you're in jail, you're not playing football either during your prime, you know, years, right? Like for, for what he did and, and then the amount of time uh, any running back has uh, for shelf life in the NFL, you know, that, that would be the real punishment, right? Like actually punish him for the crime that he did and then in the process loses his career. Yeah, I mean, look, in a it, sick you know, and twisted I'm, way, like how much is, is it worse to say, Wow, if Ray Rice wouldn't have beat his girlfriend, what could he have been, right? Like, but give him that window after the fact when he would have been in his prime. That's like living in hell, because you're always going to want that time. Audio, if it was only on audio, or it was just you know hearsay, maybe. Yeah, like, it's crazy. He would have been in the league still if it wasn't on video, for sure. Uh, that's how the NFL works. It's terrible, you know. Well, and yeah. It's just a completely different way of how they hand down discipline, you know, with, especially since Goodell's been there. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Yeah, we yeah. can go all day about the, the merit. I mean, look, we could even bring up Ray Lewis. You really want to get polar about something, bring up Ray Lewis. This guy's a Hall yeah. of Famer at this point, right? Absolutely. Now he's, now he's a hero. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't blame him. needs to C- hire his PR guy. I don't, uh, I, I don't put it all on CTE, of course, but CTE is real, for sure. My, my neighbor played for uh, the Seahawks for a while, won an uh, AFC championship ring with them, um, and he up one day and robbed two banks, and now he's in jail, like, just randomly. Didn't need the money, super normal guy, just all of a sudden upped and robbed two banks at gunpoint, just because, just for no other reason. Like, it's, you know what, man? I think the best – I think the best example, and it's not necessarily that this is provable, but I feel like this is – so understand, people, there's no scientific evidence of this that I'm aware of. This is just my observations and opinions. Look at how far Anthony Brown fell off the deep end after he had that nasty concussion hit. Yep. Like, that's a defining moment in that dude's career. He was not a diva. He was a normal team player, loved Ben Roethlisberger, everything. He got crushed coming across the middle, was out for a while with that concussion, and then his life just started falling apart. Yeah, yeah. 
it's I mean, the whole dancing yeah. with the stars thing is unexcusable. Like, why would he ever even go on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely an A to B, you know, logic behind it. Like, you can only get hit in the head so many times or hard enough to where it's going to start affecting you in, in certain ways. But, yeah, I'm not blaming it on that, but I'm saying there is there's some pretty significant correlation there. Yeah, I think I it's, think it it's, is. It's yeah. So Zach, real quick, give every, get everybody up to speed. What's your what's your background story? How'd you get to Zip Bonds? I mean, I know you have an agency yeah. and some other stuff you guys are doing. Give them the the ten thousand foot overview, and then let's just dive in and start sure. talking shop. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, much like you did did some retail. Oh, nice. Right? Um, <laughs> you know, they came from that background, what, right? That was my. What big did you thing. do? What, what kind of hours. retail? I, there, there's uh, it's so many things. Oh, okay. Sold shoes. Women's shoes, I right? Women's shoe game. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, Store manager. My, my main shoe. thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> my my main thing uh, was U.S. Cellular. It's a small. Um, it's like a. It's a you know regional Verizon, if you will. You know, uh, so I did that. Yeah, hated the idea of that. I was gonna always work on Saturday, Sunday, leaving on Black Friday. When I just wanted to get out of it. And so after college, you know, it was a great place to work. I just need to go do something else and. Um, I left, went to Charlotte, been around racing all my life, wanted to go check that scene out, you know. It's a place to do it. Uh, figure out if I was going to work in NASCAR or some other type of motorsports thing. I actually started a junk removal business down there while, while I was there. And um, my now uh, girlfriend, I was trying to get back at the time, now wife, uh, wouldn't move to, to Charlotte. So ended up going to uh, going to see about her and went to Chicago and needed a job. And so I, I wanted to you know, be back into a place where I could be an entrepreneur again when I sold the, the junk business, which is it's cool to me, at least, that it's still in business. The guy who bought it from me is still using it or, or running it and um, it's going well. But I wanted to learn something that I could eventually turn into being my own uh, business owner, you know, uh, run a business again. And so insurance was just the first place that hired me. Right. So I did that. Did with the whole State Farm route, decided I didn't like the captive side. We started talking about having a family. That was when it was time to come back to Iowa became a uh, commercial insurance producer at a, a decent sized uh, shop here in the area and uh, was just getting on the phone cold calling, you know, trying to figure it out. And that's, you know, you talk about where Zip came from. That was that was really the, the start of my frustration with surety uh, was the guy, you know, starting to write some commercial contractor accounts. And I needed to be able to know enough about surety to be able to close those because they wanted all their stuff in one place. Uh, and, and our agency was competing against other agencies that had a surety division. So there wasn't really a subject matter expert um, that was the producer on those other accounts, but they had a division they could send everything off to. And that's kind of, you know, what we've morphed this into. So a lot of what Zip came from is uh, is really contract surety, especially small contract surety, that, that you know, credit only type system. That's uh, we felt like the process needed to be a lot better and we needed to do a better job of educating those in, in the space. So that's where Zip came from. You know, I, I skipped over the part where we started scratch agency in 2016 that's still small in business detail. yeah right <laughs> yeah small detail. <laughs> nobody yeah so uh and, and I, for for you know the first part of it at least we were still writing a lot of commercial insurance both my business partner ryan and i our background for the, for the most part was in commercial and so we did that to keep the lights on but we really wanted to find a model that was uh you know uh, scalable uh in a way that we had seen it done at the shop that we left you know they they still do something like 50, 60% of the malpractice insurance for chiropractors in the entire country. And so we saw how they they built that out and said, wouldn't it be cool if we could kind of, you know, hitch our wagon to an affinity and do the same thing, which, which uh, of course, we did with credit unions. And so Coverage Direct now is 100% focused on building out turnkey platforms for credit unions. That's, that's, that's all they do. And I couldn't tell you much of what's going on over there anymore because the whole focus of my, uh, you know, at least the end of 21 has been zip. So that's We're interesting, man. Like, so coverage direct your agency and you built that agency servicing credit unions as channel partners referral just referral partners do you like actually have formalized joint ventures that you use when you when you engage with them so it's the latter but i'll tell you it wasn't really clear uh how it was going to get started yeah, so we had the is. opportunity <laughs> Right. Right. And I think that's the thing that most people don't talk about is they, they assume like, oh, one day they figured it out and everything was just good to go, you know, and that's just it's not the case. So um, it, it really just I, I asked the question, you know, why don't you have an agency? We were writing a lot of business for this one particular credit union, fourth largest uh, in the state of Iowa. And the top three and five and six all had agencies and they didn't. So I just asked why. Uh, and I got us a, a conversation with the CFO and. Uh, you know, jokingly, we tell him it took him two years to finally decide that he wanted to work with us, but it was it was pretty close to that. 
And then it was, it was a partnership where we were running coverage direct, direct to consumer, separate from what we built out for them. And then it just became too confusing and it was causing a lot of problems. So we rolled a direct to consumer side of what we have with coverage direct, that book into what they were doing at, at Collins. And then um, it's actually just changing now. We're going to create what's called a, it's a CUSO, a credit union service organization that helps, uh, you know, credit unions invest in ways that they're otherwise you know, sometimes limited to um, for you know, regulated re- regulation. Yeah, there's a different set of rules that they play by uh, compared to traditional it, banks too. Like the insurability levels of the of the deposits you make are are not as much, and just some other regulatory stuff. I actually sat next to a dude from CUNA Mutual at a CIC update one time, and that's yeah. all they do is insure credit unions. He was an interesting guy to listen to talk that yeah that whole model there is different i mean they do a lot of stuff where they they sort of compete against all of us in the direct consumer where they're trying to do pnc they do life really well they do some pnc uh the majority of that ends up going to liberty mutual you know so depending on if that's competitive in your state by the way liberty mutual king of the affinity program (laughs) and acquiring other carriers did you graduate from burns junior high school we have an affinity program where you can (laughs) save on your auto and i mean we get so many things in the mail and it's all backed by liberty you make yeah. spaghetti on a Wednesday, yeah, you're I'm part of the affinity program. Yeah, it's seriously, man. Yeah. They've got one for everything. Zach, how do you like working with that? That is absolutely right. Yeah, that's, so that's what they do um, a lot. Of, they, in our, at least what we've seen, they don't do a ton of that with the PNC side, what they have. But that was kind of the, the you know, uh, I guess the opportunity is the fact that we were able to bring different carriers and a different mindset of how we could sell and help them, you know, provide great coverage to their to their members and uh, it's worked out really well, and now we've just you know built that model out as more or less a rinse and repeat, if you will, white label product, and, and doing that as a you know best in class sales and service center. So it's it's a call center type of environment that we've set up there, and um, you know my business partner Ryan has been handling most of that and, and running with that. He's transitioned over here a little bit. We've got some great leaders now that are are taking that to the next level. But yeah, I mean that was um, but one of the things was we figured out our AMS issue that we were having, and the heavy lift there was done. I was like, okay, this surety thing's been bothering us for a while and, and we saw you know we believe it was an opportunity because we tried to find a solution and at the time this was you know middle of 19 there was nothing out there that really fit what we were trying to do which was how do we fix the problem of helping someone get qualified for in a better you know faster way for especially in the small contract side but then if it doesn't fit for whatever reason credit or you know years of experience or just the, the scope of work of the project how do we then make that a really easy transition into what would be a brokered process where you, instead of having to re-explain everything all over again and filling out another application or going through the whole process and waiting on somebody else to, you know, when we get to it, how can we speed that up and make that a better, you know, process for the contractor directly? And in the process, how do we also help agents who maybe are in the place I was in 2013, 14, whatever it was, that I needed that bond department in our agency that we didn't have access to. So. Um, that's really the, the start of Zip and where it came from. Yeah, so the bonding thing has always been interesting to me because there's agencies out there that do nothing but, and that just is crazy. Well, the, to... the commission levels are so good on bonds. Oh, I mean, listen, man, I wrote I wrote a bond line. Commission on a bond, <laughs> like it's I, all day. Yeah, I wrote a bond for a massive electrical contractor, a bond line with Zurich. Yeah. Massive electrical contractor who had the contract to run all of the electrical and any new construction co- IKEAs nationwide. Which, by the way, it would blow your mind how much electricity is in an IKEA. I'm sure um, it's the same. Yeah. And they also had a contract for uh, uh, doing the electrical work on bridges. But anyhow, all I know is my commission for the agency off yeah. of that bond line was like one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Just one bond line. Yeah. And by the way, ask me how much work I had to do to service that. Like none. Yeah. None. You issue the bond and you're done. But the problem is, and, and where I think you know companies like Zip come into play, is not that. Like you, you need to you need to work that. You can't. That, that's not something that can be automated. You're not going to go get a multi million dollar bond line right. that requires financials and right. greasy. Like I look, I got that deal done in a way that I'm not proud of. I actually, <laughs> this will be great <laughs> podcast material. But I actually found out who the regional VP for Zurich was. And I didn't realize it, but he worked out at the same YMCA that I was working out at at the time. <laughs> and I literally followed him into the locker room, nice. stopped, stopped <laughs> short of the shower, 
Yeah, did you corner him? Yeah. What happened? <laughs> yeah, it, like slowly, slowly was pretending like I was getting dressed to work out when my only deal was I needed to get a contract with them so that I could put this bond deal together. <laughs> so yeah. people, it's yeah. not always, it's not always, you know, flowery how you get deals done. You gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. And so, yeah, I stalked this guy, but you know, it's that nuisance stuff, man. It's the small bonds that every agency has to do, but like, I don't want to have to deal with, you know, the, these licensing well, you, bonds. You don't want to do it and neither does your team. Right. And, and the, the problem that we were having is, you know, a lot of these things, it just didn't make sense as to why we were being told no when we first started, you know, on trying to write these. It's like, well, you know, they, they've only been in business for a year. Okay, but they, they've been doing work for 10 years, right. you know, or the, or the credit, it's real close, but not quite there. Yeah, well, they also have X in, in the bank account. It was never really a, uh, a, a true credit only process for us, at least in, in our experience, you know, and, and, and so to your point of getting those bigger ones, those are great, but a lot of what we set out to solve is just the the, the smaller ones, the ones that, you know, just take up time. You can't be a subject matter expert. You get frustrated if they get told no. You don't have somebody going to bat for you. That's what we wanted to fix for ourselves. And in the way that we did it, you know, just happened to be that we could also help agents um, along the way. Well, well if you I'll don't tell do you what, it, somebody else is going to do it. And they're going to steal your other business as well. So they're going to go and shop. Well, that's, and, and, and Ryan, you're right. That's the thing, too. And the other thing that I, I really hope that people that are hearing this, especially green producers, because... You know, I wish somebody would have talked to me about this and use this as a different angle to kind of get that wedge in. You know, if you lead with surety or find a way to help people get um, access to a bonding capacity that they didn't have prior or let them yep. at least know that they can be bonded, because a lot of them don't, that's stickier than anything else. So even if you lose the PNC, you're likely not going to lose the surety and you're probably not going to lose the PNC because they care more about being able to continue to do that uh, more so than they do about, you know, what the other guy is bringing in for a, for a cost savings on the PNC side. Yeah, it's... Um... It's interesting to see how sticky the bonding really is because I've had some really good middle market accounts that I've picked up and I've never been able to get the bonding to move. And I mean, it's not – look, I follow people into locker rooms to get bonding <laughs> done. So You're I mean, following them into Chili's on a Friday night. Like, yeah. Hey, let me buy you a baby beer and let's let's chat. Yeah, but I mean – Yeah, at a certain – Go ahead, Zach. A certain size, though, you're really – at a certain size, you really know a ton about that person and it's it's one of those – processes that's not a lot of fun to go right. through and, and you almost feel vulnerable like they've literally know everything about my financial situation they know you know what i've been through and all this it's like that 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 hassle of trying to figure out how to get through that with somebody else again just probably isn't worth it regardless even if the rate's different right that's just not something most people are willing to do yeah i agree i agree 100 percent. what what i like about where where you guys are headed and, and with the automation of all of this and just being able to go on and do quote bind issue bonds people listen by the way if you're a producer and you're new i'm getting ready to give you absolute gold so turn it up and take I some notes like you turn out gold all day though so this is not <laughs> like a one-off man no right? this is a one-off man this is a good one this is an actual strategy that i've used in the past and, and it works well but one of the things you can do is you can find these contractor schools right so we've got a bunch of them here in tampa and they go through the school to become a licensed plumber or a GC or electrician. And the first thing they need is a license bond and a permit bond. They're not expensive bonds, man. They're a pain in the rear end. I mean, not a pain. It's just, it's, it's just you have to stop what you're doing to fill out the application for minimal money is really what it is. You know, you, could you make decent money doing it? Yeah, you're going to make like 30 bucks a bond. Can I turn four of them an hour to make 120 bucks? Why would I do that when my hourly rate's like $500 to produce right. middle market? Yeah. It's, it's just not a good business yeah. decision. So, you know, what I did was I have partnered with a couple of those contractor schools here in Tampa and I'll go out and I will absolutely no sales pitch whatsoever, but I'll give them an hour on insurance and risk management as they're going into business just to teach them. And then boom, now they can buy their bonding from me. And once we get that in once and, and I'm in Zach, I'll be interested to hear how your how your back end process works as far as this goes, but the way that it's set up in my agency right now is we'll get an email notification that has all the information we need about the, the bond they bought, name, email, blah, 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 blah. We, we use a parser. We pull that information out and we push it in to create the contact record inside HubSpot. And we're immediately remarketing to them for their PNC lines because we know that if they don't have a bond, they don't have insurance yet. Yep. Yep. And so we're getting the auto. We're getting the GL and the umbrella and everything else. And then we flip around and we market to them for their personal lines as well. 
So when I look at yeah. this stuff, man, a lot of times people probably look at things like the, bo- the, the, the nuisance bonds is what we call them, Zach. And I don't want to hurt your feelings with that. But, you know, the nuisance bonds in the oh. agency world. But it's also like what we do here with wedding insurance, right? People think I'm nuts because I've got I own Florida wedding insurance. Well, what's not nuts? What's not nuts is the fact that it's over a hundred thousand dollar revenue stream of passive income that goes directly into my pocket every year, yeah, right? Yeah. But more importantly, we spend one hundred and fifty dollars a month in Google Ads to push traffic to a landing page so people can buy wedding insurance through passive revenue. And guess what? As long as I'm not spending more for my ad revenue than I am making in revenue, then I'm cash flow positive on my ad spend, right? I'm getting paid for leads. I don't view the wedding insurance as the revenue stream. It's nice that it's there, but what I really want is to be able to retarget and market to these people for their home, auto, yep. life, well, umbrella, they discipline. They combine all their policies into one account because they're getting married. So perfect. Yeah. That's right. It would be awesome if there was like a mobile app or something that I could just start this process in and then- Weird. <laughs> That'd be crazy. Well, I wonder if one of those Jeez. exists. It's, be not crazy somebody somebody could do that too. It's, it's, it's a project to say the least. Uh, Zach, I wanted to go back to something you were talking about, which uh, we used yeah. to use when we marketed commercial um, with, with contractors and especially as competitive as the contractor market is right now, but you can't find a contractor. If you're looking to renovate your house, your business, like it's impossible. No, my father-in-law is trying to do a build out on a, um, uh, in, like a 24 hour ER um, site that he's setting up. Can't find a contractor to save his life. If you're helping right. these contractors get higher bond limits so they can take higher jobs or better jobs, bigger jobs, now you're bringing revenue into their pocket. You're creating revenue right. through the bond, which is beautiful. We used to pitch that all the time. So Yeah. So, I, I mean, in my, my pitch when I went out there is, you know, just figure out, first of all, what did I want to go after? And it happened to be a contractor is just were a niche that I liked. So, um, you know, it, it worked there. But when I would add surety to be a part of that, once I kind of figured that out, you know, that's something that they're not used right. to hearing. And a lot of times the misconception, especially on these, you know, you say middle market, but I'll even say like small, not quite middle sure, market yeah. ones that are have a hum, uh, tremendous amount of growth potential. They over they, they think it's more complicated than it is. It's 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 more complicated than uh, the time is worth uh, for them to figure out what their bonding capacity is. So so what we created with what we call our zip score is a way in here in the API. I wish it were right there. And, and Brian, maybe I'll, after this, we could talk about, you know, some of the complications we're running into that. But it should be done here relatively soon where you can put that in to your website, branded to you, you know, it's a hyperlink, you go in there, and then you go prospect with those, you know, contractors you believe maybe haven't ever had a bond before, and within 90 seconds, you can get them pre-qualified for up to $750,000 of bonding capacity. That that is what I would have loved to have had when I was that green producer trying to go out and say something that was different to open up these different accounts, because even if you didn't get the PNC right away, to your point, David, with the wedding insurance, I mean, that's still a way to get them initially on you know start marketing to them and then what we're going to do is help them find those projects you know by the way i noticed this you know rfp just came out within 25 miles of where you're at you know it's well within your bonding pass you might want to take a look at that now you're providing value outside that's of a great that's idea just man that's, yeah. that's huge david let me ask you so that's that's more let me ask you a question yep. david What's that? uh for Carruthers, so i mean there's so many good marketing ideas right there's so many ways that you can skin a cat that you know you lead with the work comp which is beautiful zach you lead with the bonds how, how do producers choose which avenues to really bust their ass and go market to? Because you can't overspread yourself, right? That's what we preach no. at our agency. People would pick five, six, seven different marketing strategies, and you're a jack of all trades. You're not good at one thing. How do you pick? Yeah, so I look at this two different ways. Um, the, the first way that I look at it is what do I have the most information on? What can I get the most information on in public domain to be the most educated on people who fit in that class of business? And I'll tell you a story about where that came from. And I'm glad to know that I have you fooled too, that I lead with workers comp because the whole country thinks that, and that's a really dangerous supposition for people to make when I'm calling on their accounts. I love it. Um, (laughs) I'm, I'm, busting your chops but um but but to my point that's why we do i do like to lead with comp right now because i've got so much at my fingertips from the state of florida that i can get from the department of financial services website that when i combine that with ncci's risk workstation i know everything about that account is as far as the the profile the risk profile from a workers comp standpoint sans loss runs 
to, to validate what an experience mod is or anything. So that's one of the reasons why it's much easier to pick up the phone to call somebody when you have information that's immediately relevant to them, whether their mods above one. And I want to bring that up or another thing that we do <clears throat> again, here comes some gold producers is we go into the NCCI risk workstation website and a lot of people. So here's a hack. If you're into workers comp, a lot of people, a lot of States are moving to that kind of unified reporting platform where <clears throat> when you go in to check to, to do coverage verification, I forget the name of the provider, but it basically says as of this date, which is the date that you're on, this company has workers compensation in effect with this carrier. But it doesn't tell you what the X date is on the policy, but now you know who the carrier is. So if you go to Risk Workstation, the rating effective date is in there. If you just type the company name in, you don't have to pull the mod, but the rating effective date shows up. Now you know what the X date is. And you can go to that template that's at the top. There's a button at the top right to click sub subscribe to notifications, and you can do that in perpetuity. So a great way to build a lead stream if you want to lead with workers' comp is to go in and everybody that, that you pull from your leads list when you create it, subscribe to those notifications in NCCI every night at 8 o'clock. I get an email from NCCI and the entire bottom half of it is every company whose mod has changed in the last 24 gold hours. Gold leads being dumped in your inbox. Every yeah, so now, now, now here, here I am, right? The next morning I get up, what am I going to do? Me and my producers are going to call everybody on that list. And people will say, well, what if, what if their mod's good? Good, then I can be the guy that can be the first person to congratulate them on their new mod because their agent's still in bed. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And yep. so it doesn't matter. We get caught up so many times in the details and we create situations when you just need to just do it. Just do it and trust the process. And so bad mod, we can talk to them about it. Good mod, we can congratulate them. But any day it's a touch point, people, and you have more information. When I look at things like the bonding and the wedding insurance and all of that, it's never to close the deal. All I want to do is get that information into my CRM. Yep. The, the reason I do it the way that I do it is because I don't have to pay to get the information in my CRM. I can get yep. paid for it, which is a better idea. But the other thing is, you know, for people who want to figure out what they're going to what they're going to lead with and what they're going to what verticals they're going to build or whatever. I am 100 percent consistent in this advice. I've been giving it for years. And some people listen. Some people don't. The people who listen usually call me back and thank me for it. But we get so caught up in, in the hot list from the marketing people, right? Every, every marketing person that comes into your agency has the hot list. I don't want the hot list. That's what everybody else is writing. Yeah. You know, yeah. if that's what everybody else is writing, I want to go the completely different direction. So when I talk to producers, I tell them they need to have the relationship with the underwriters, not in the cliche way that we have all heard ever since we got into the industry. Oh, you got to build a relationship with your underwriters. No, this is for very selfish reasons, and I'll admit that. You need to have the relationship with the underwriter because you want to call your underwriter at every company that you have a dedicated underwriter, and you want to ask each one of your underwriters this question. What is a class of business that you're really good at, really competitive at, and never see from anybody else? Yep. And if you can ask that question and you can get an answer to it, you don't ever have to worry about building a leads list again. You're going to build your leads list around that, and you pick off a couple of them, and guess what? Your underwriter is going to start funneling leads to you too. But the other nice part about that is if they don't deliver on terms and conditions or pricing or whatever else, now you can hold them accountable because they're the ones who told you they were good at it. Yep. So you, you don't say it that way, but what you just did is you pre-qualified your underwriter before you pre-qualify your prospect before you go out. That's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. And, and I hope if there's a green producer, if they, they rewind and listen to what you just said about that risk work, uh, workstation and go to NCCI and figure that out, that is exactly how I built a lot of what we did uh, initially as a, as a commercial producer. It's exact and it works. And you don't even have to be that great at, at the pitch. You just have to be consistent and put in the yeah. work. If you can do that and you can do enough contacts a yeah. day, you can't fail. It's impossible. That works so well. And uh, I think that most people might not quite have caught what that is. And they need to rewind and listen to that again and figure out what you just said, because it, it, that's gold. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a matter of what you do with it, right? You get the list. So at that point, you do pull the mod. You have to pay to do it. But we know that the people we're following are within certain parameters. So we're not even following anybody in NCCI whose total account, and, and pay attention to this, people. I'm not talking about workers' comp only revenue. We project out what we think the total revenue for the account would be. So it's not an exact yeah. science, but we're pretty close. But there's nothing under 25000 of revenue in that list. So right. I know that if I pay to pull 100 mods, at least 40 of them are going to be 1.0 or higher. So now if I know that I'm getting 40, of pe 40 people who are 1.0 or higher of at least 25 grand in total account revenue to the agency, for every $600 I spend, I'm buying a million dollar in revenue opportunity. 
and, and you're going to hear agency principals bitch and moan about spending six dollars on a mod because they can't see the forest through the trees you know people if you own an agency and you still worry about what things cost instead yeah. of what things will make you you need yeah. to shift your mindset or you're going to be out of business yeah, yeah. People are agency yeah. owners by and large are, are pretty terrible at calculating uh, return on investment, period. They don't they don't do a good job of quantifying uh, their output versus their input. It's very easy if you just sit down and look at it. Um, but I, my thing is when and we'll talk about it, the one city world tour, we're going to uh, do a, a whole training on it. But you know, this is the time of year where everybody's goal planning, right? Uh, marketing, marketing. How are we going to market? What are we going to do? We're going to do Google AdWords. We're going to do Facebook leads. We're going to go out and see real estate agents and mortgage brokers. And, we're gonna and go, my favorite is SEO. We're really going to yeah, double down on our SEO gonna, this year. We're going to ramp up SEO. We're going to get some, uh, you know, fanny packs like Nick Ayers. We're going to take some photos by the pool. I don't know. <laughs> the problem is people, oh. people have too many ways to market. You don't. My thing is you need 1.25 ways to market. You need your main shtick and you need a quarter of another shtick. And that is it. That is all you need to be successful. And then and just be consistent, be put in the work. We talk about this with our team all the time. Like you don't have to be the most polished. No. Your pitch doesn't have to be elaborate. You just have to put in the work and be consistent. I talk about our, uh, our, our 50 IPAs a day, income producing activities. You have to do 50 of those a day and have at least 10 meaningful conversations or some sort of contact with those people that you're going after. And that's it. That's all you have to do. It, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just continue to put in the work and it'll be there. Why do you think college athletes are typically some of the most sought after people to work in, in our space. You know, they come out of, they, they, they just know how to put in the work. Right. They know how and to put in focused, the repetition. Man. They're, not, they're not trying to do 10 things. They're trying right. to do one thing and be amazing at it. And it's not rocket science, yep. but most people don't have the attention span or the commitment level to focus on one thing and see it through, you know, sink or swim. See it through for right. 90 days, see it through. You know? I've had such a weird phenomenon. I mean, and this speaks to the point of just being consistent and having one thing. So if you follow me on LinkedIn, you never see me post any content about Florida risk on LinkedIn, right? Shame on me for doing that. But I'm very, very consistent about killing commercial power producer stuff on LinkedIn. Yeah. And what what has transpired over the last couple of months is I have gotten probably four or five random uh, LinkedIn messages from controllers, CFOs, or risk managers of large middle market accounts in other states that said, hey, we follow you on LinkedIn and we see the information that you're using to train other, um, other insurance agents. And we're not getting that from our agent right now. And we'd really like to do business with somebody who thinks like you. Could you write business in our state? Or do you have someone in your network that you would recommend that's going to do the things that you talk about? Now, that content has nothing to do with that person yeah. that has consumed it. But I consistently put it out and they see me put it out. And so at some point, somebody gets interested and they click on it. And all of a sudden, it's like, wow, this guy's kind of different. He's teaching other agents how to do this. Why aren't I seeing this? There's a... There's another thing too that I could say to that because the consistency part, if you're not great at it, like me, admittedly, I'm not at putting out that content and doing different things if I'm in charge of it. There's so many great freelancers that you can you can hire. It's very inexpensive. They can help put you on that agenda and that list and that calendar and get things put put out there. So if, I think, you know, if you're just honest with yourself and you're not great at it, like, I, like I've had to be, just find someone and hire someone to do that for you. And you're right. It doesn't have to be specifically like, you know, hey, buy this, do that. You know, it's education, but more than anything, it's just top of mind, you know, at least for us because... It's not something you, not everybody needs a bond all the time, but if they're seeing this, I mean, we had one that reached out just this week said, hey, you know, I just happened to see you in one of the publications here locally that, that was out there. And it's because we're pushing out content all the time. We had this bond that came up. I uh, just thought I'd give you guys a try, you know, and, and again, it wasn't me doing that all the time, but we have somebody that does that for us because we know that the consistency is important. Yeah. When you when you commit to a market strategy, you're not coming in on Monday morning wondering what the week's going to look like. Right. And right. It becomes so addicting. It really does. You know, we're notorious for it. We called on mortgage brokers. We built a hundred million dollar personalized book calling on mortgage brokers. That's all we did. Monday yep. through Monday through Sunday. And you yep. never question your schedule. You never question your week. You're literally trying to create more time to go call more mortgage brokers to get more leads. Like literally that's all you do. So when you commit to a strategy and you understand that that strategy is going to be the core of what you're going to execute on a monthly, weekly, daily basis, the job becomes second nature at that point. You know exactly what your week's going to look like. You're not guessing where the revenue is going to come from. And it's, it's, it's pure consistency. That's it. 90 days. You give it 90 days. That's it. It's, but people have a very hard time committing to it. And that's the number one reason why marketing fails. Marketing is good in any aspect if you just commit to it, period. Yep. 
Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. So, Ryan, you had a good question last time. What else you got in your back pocket for us? Yeah. I want to know, Zach. So you came back to Iowa, dude. How's that, man? So you said you came. Were you in Chicago, or your your girlfriend was in Chicago? How'd that work out? That's a big shift back to Iowa. So, so we, well, I mean, yeah, we met. So you can see I'm wearing yeah, my Iowa, Iowa State, State stand up, right? It has a good has a good day today. Later at the the bowl yeah. game, we'll know when this is uh, uh, actually published if they did or not. But um, yeah, I mean, the Charlotte thing was great. I liked being out there, but again, you know, things more important than. Uh, what I was doing at the time. And so Chicago land area, I wasn't really in Chicago, um, in the suburbs. I actually worked in Schaumburg, but um, it just, it wasn't for me. So going back to Iowa, like I know people give yeah. Iowa a hard time and, and, you know, say it's overlooked or whatnot. It's the mecca and of insurance, I, I, I feel like. I feel like it's- like, it, it, Per capita, there's more people employed, yeah. yep, in Des Moines and in the insurance industry than anywhere else in the country. And they took over, I think it was from, it was Hartford or Columbus here. Uh, really, I would have guessed Omaha um, was up there too. I, it, it is, but I mean, I think it's always been Columbus, Hartford, Connecticut, and when Des Moines, Iowa. Iowa. And yeah. so, yeah, quite a few it was ominous. We were here. down in uh, Des Moines uh, this past summer and went past the Nationwide building. And I mean, it was vacant <laughs> and it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, they have a whole it's, city block plus. They do. It's a ghost town uh, down there a lot right now. Them and the EMC, you know, we have Principal. is one of the largest uh, companies yeah. here uh, that, you know, as far as from the insurance sector. But yeah, I mean, I, I just like to tell people, you know, when they give us a hard time about Iowa, you know, say, oh man, you're uh, you're really isolated out there in Iowa. And I like to think of it the fact that we're insulated from a lot of the crap that everyone else has yeah. to deal with. So I, I, I like being in Iowa. I, I know that seems weird. I enjoyed being down in Tampa here at IOA and enjoying that weather for a little bit. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it's just the way I'm wired. I, I like Iowa a lot. you guys get a lot of producers coming over from the... Um, uh, from the carrier side and, and what does that look like for you guys do you know a lot of producers that make that jump or people that make that jump yeah yeah it's it's a that's a good point uh it, there's a joke about the fact that you know nationwide does a really good job of initially training all the people that eventually get hired by either the right. regionals or the insurance agents what that so yeah nationwide does a good job of that for us because they've got a good training program uh, but yeah we do see a lot of that i think i would say i can speak firsthand to the, the some of the regionals um, have plucked away some of the, the really great talent that's over there, but yeah, we we'll, we'll see we'll see it there. I mean, it's just you're going to see a lot of that, and you know, uh, any type of industry that has a lot of it going on. I'm sure it's the same thing in Silicon Valley, and you know, um, with, with tech jobs. It's interesting. It's got to be attractive for carrier people that have that entrepreneurial mindset that that want to jump over to the independent side. I'd love to interview some of them and see what they think of was the was the agent side what you expected because I think there's. Uh, I think there's a big barrier between what carriers think agents do and what they actually do. And it's always a conversation we have on our podcast. Right. Um, I think it's a lot different than what they think it is, for sure. Yeah, yeah I think uh, it's really hard to understand all the stresses of being an entrepreneur, whether it's insurance or anything else, without actually doing it. And I think a lot of times people um, aren't able to you know, get past the fears that they have to be able to take that jump and, and really you know, it's never going to be easy. You just got to do it. I mean, you just have to do it. You, you can't overthink it and go do it. And I think the ones that have made the jump will probably tell you that, no, it wasn't exactly what I expected because I thought I was going to be at the, you know, uh, the country club and golfing and going out to all these different mixes or whatnot, you know, and not, you know, worrying at least those first few years about hitting payroll and, you know, uh, making sure all the bills are paid. But those that are actually wired and, and can, again, can be consistent and see it through will probably say they're really glad that they did because, you know, it's, it's more about being an entrepreneur, I think, than, than anything. Right. It's not it's not just the, um, the the insurance space. Well, I mean, there's a mass exodus right now, you know, going on in general from people leaving their jobs, finding new jobs. I know, Carruthers, you've talked about how you recruit producers. I don't know if you're able to talk about it or not, but you, you told us about it in Chicago. You've got a very specific way that you recruit producers for your team. I don't know if you want to touch on that because I, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, no, man. I mean, I'd, I'd like to tell you it was born out of intelligence. It was actually born out of poverty and street smarts because yeah. when I launched my agency in my dining room, I didn't have any money, right? Yeah. So I needed to figure out a way to scale the agency without having to pump a bunch of money into it. And I realized pretty quickly that, you know, number one, all of us know that if you have good channel partnerships, regardless of whether it's personal lines, medical, you know, commercial, whatever, people referring business into you when you're not having to do anything other than accept that referral is a great way yep. to augment all of the activity you're intentionally doing. You can't rely on it a hundred percent unless you have it dialed in. Like a lot of people, I mean, think you guys had it pretty dialed in at your agency, but 
for the average PNC producer that's going out in the middle market, you're just not going to have that kind of volume of referrals coming in. And so I found pretty quickly that if I could help payroll providers solve a problem, which is pulling business out of a PEO because they needed a comp solution to get the business out of the PEO yep. that they would refer me more business. And, you know, same thing holds true. IT service providers, you know, they will refer business into me uh, and I refer people to them for managed services, things like that. But I, I finally realized one day, these are business to business salespeople. They're calling on people every single day. They don't have residual income in their books of business. So, why don't I show them the path to that? And so really how we recruit now, and I, I can even take it a step further than what you heard me talk about in Chicago, but what I like, what I do is I establish a referral relationship. It's for, kind of informal, but formal at the same time in that we meet once a month for coffee and they are required to bring two booked appointments, period. And I bring two booked appointments with my clients. That does not mean, hey, David, call this guy. He might be expecting your call. I told him maybe you would call sometime next week. It's you're walking me into a conference room with someone who understands why I'm coming there and has, and has given us an hour or 30 minutes or whatever. And I do the same for them. And we let that ride for three or four months. You know, if they come in and they, if they come to meet with me one month and they don't have any booked appointments, they get a free pass. If they come a second time, they're out. It's really that simple. Yep. It's got to, it's got to work both ways. And so, you know, three, four, five months, I'll see how it works and we'll meet that, you know, meet for a normal meeting and I'll plant the seed and say, you know, out of curiosity, you're a really good salesperson. I'm, I'm wondering why you've chosen to hang your shingle in the payroll industry. I mean, you don't have residual income and you're constantly starting over every year and da 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 da. And, you know, I'll get the standard answers of, well, you know, I make a good living. We get to go on the vacations we want to go. I win good trips from the company. We drive nice cars. If we want to go out and eat, we don't have to worry about putting it on a credit card, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But within 24 hours, every single time, I either get an email or a phone call. Hey, man, did you like, I didn't want you to think I wasn't interested, but what, what's the opportunity that you had? So we'll get to, we'll get back together with the specific purpose of talking about that, you know, within a week usually. And I'll pull the reports from our, our system to see what we've closed that they walked us into. And so, you know, we'll be four or five months into the relationship and I'll walk in and we will have closed like $200,000 worth of revenue that they've referred in. And I can show them that and say, if you would, if you worked in our agency, you would have made $80,000 over the course of the last four or five months. Is that the income that you're used to making slinging payroll? And it's never the income that they're right. making slinging payroll. Right. That might be close to their annual or maybe just a hair under it. And so they become, they're interested in it at that point. And so I ask them, tell me what you want and tell me what you need. I can, we can map what you need and get that taken care of. And then it's up to you to earn what you want. I'll give you the vessel to go get it, but that's on you. I'm not going to just give you your wants. That's for you right. to earn. And so we keep everything inside a HubSpot. We have been tracking them as referral sources from day one. We continue to do that. And when the, the revenue commissions equal what their need was to leave, I make them a formal job offer to come in and they'll come work with us. And then I'll hand them the book of business that they referred to us. I have zero financial risk because they're already validated. They have no risk because they've already been referring that business in and they know there's an income stream and I don't have to worry about retention because these are already clients they have done business with. So the personal relationship is already there. And so that's, that's how we bring producers in. I have a pipeline of producers nonstop. I've got three licensed producers right now ready to go 1-1-2023 or 2022. And so the cool part about that there's a couple cool things about it. The first one is I can now build my, if I want to scale Florida risk into way more than what it is, I can take guys like Kyle and Raphael and other people in my organization and I can let them sit on top. I don't want to say pyramid scheme because it's not, but I can let them become sales leaders in the organization and they can go build those own channel relationships for them, recruit people the same way, bring them in, let them take them under their wing and give them an override for managing that process. I don't have to be involved. Look guys, that's the whole reason killing commercial exists. I had to get digital to be able to teach my process. Yep, I just yep. figured out how to monetize that too. And I think the beautiful thing about what you're saying, whether it be recruiting, marketing, uh, or otherwise, if you're an agency principal and you're listening right now, 
you have to learn the process first before you can teach other people in your organization to do it as well. And I think that's something that's missed quite a bit. at That's agencies. why I do not have a recruiting process for service people, right? Because right. I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible. Yeah. Like, I'm the, I, look, when people ask me about operations and servicing, I am completely transparent. I'm a, I am a producer, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I can't be both. Now, if, all my, if my only job was to handle operations, obviously I can do that. I did it for the first 10 years of my adult life. Right. That's not what I want to do. So yeah. I'm not going to be the guy that teaches. That's why I have total CSR, man. I outsource all of that to the Goodmans and let them teach my people how to handle the desk because I, yeah. I would, they would fail yeah, miserably. You Right, you can't scale unless you have those things in place. And you're right, Ryan. I mean, you have to know what you're doing, and that's why you know with our our relationship, Ryan was really good at that stuff, right? The operations side, the service side, and whatnot. Because I'm awful at it, and and you know, vice versa. It's not he doesn't love doing this the sales side in a way have, but uh, I think the that idea, by the way, is awesome. I, I never heard that uh, approach before. And you're absolutely right. Our structure is a little bit different on the agency side. I don't know if I would necessarily work for the way we do it, but it's given me a couple other ways to, to think about it. Do you know um, why I freely share that? that? Because I know that 85% of the people listening to this will never take the first step to make that happen in their agency. I can, I can be an open crazy. book. What's 85 that? Is very, 85 is generous. <laughs> I would say Yeah, 90. I mean, that, yeah. that's the thing that's crazy. People, you listen to these podcasts every single week. Yeah. We're an open book. And if you're not making these moves in your agency to drive change, then that's on you. It's not on us, you know. I, had an agent. I still remember Nick to hear Nick Ayers say that, you know, he said, I'll, I'll help the agent across the street because I know, you know, 90% of them aren't going to do what I uh, tell them or, you know, uh, share with them what we do. And even if they do, I still think we're going to be more consistent. We're still going to be able to, to win. And there's still plenty of other business that we can go after. And, and I, that, that stuck with me back when we first started our, our agency. We do the same thing because, you know, again, it's a it's abundance mentality. You don't have to think about you know, they're always being keep all my secrets because if I share with anybody, then, you know, I'm obviously not going to be successful if they're successful. That, that isn't the way anybody should be thinking. No, but yeah. unfortunately, that's the way the old guard thinks. And I mean, that's it, it's an wow. interesting situation that we're dealing with now because, you know, we're seeing all time high multiples on agencies. Yep. Some of these guys yep. that haven't taken the time to in, in ladies too that haven't invested in their technology stacks that are, you know, they don't have the data. They don't have a good succession plan in place you're not getting max value for your agency. And if you're not willing to collaborate with that group that's behind you coming in, it can't always be the way we've always done things. You have to open up your ears and listen. My 19 year old kid is in an office in the back right now. And anything that he says regarding the communication on social platforms and everything else, I'm all ears for that. Cause I don't know all of that. Like he yeah. does. Yeah. But we have to be open-minded and think about that stuff. I'm not saying that you need to listen to every millennial in your operation and do every single thing they say, but you need to give them an ear and you need to be interactive in that dialogue and ask actual questions to show you understand what they're even telling you. And then you can make decisions yep. as to whether or not you want to adopt that stuff. But I think that there are a lot of, and I'm a tweener, man. I'm not the old guard and I'm not the new guard. I'm kind of stuck in the middle based on my age. And I, I just think yeah. that there's a lot of opportunity for guys like me that are progressive in our thought process, yeah. that watched the internet get built and all of the other yeah. things that we have right now, that we see those opportunities and we know I'm smart enough to know that in 10 years, the world is not going to look like it looks right now from a technology right. standpoint. Right. And I better be doing everything I can to learn as much as I can if I want to maximize my opportunities from that. The thing we haven't seen yeah. in the market yet is the consumers driving the conversation of what they want in the independent channel. We haven't seen that yet, and it's coming. And once that comes, every agency that's still operating, as they did 20, 30 years ago, because it still works, is gonna, they're in for a rude awakening. Because again, the consumers are gonna drive the innovation and what's necessary. We have not seen that yet, mark my words. Uh, you know, uh, this is this is the Gary Vandercheck moment. Mark, mark my words. Consumers will come in furiously to dictate what they're looking for when it comes to technology when they want to work with an agent. And if you are not at least understanding what's available, I'm not saying adopt every tool and, and gadget in, in the market, but if you don't at least understand where the business is going, you are, you're in for a rude awakening. It's going to happen, period. So I, get, I agree, and I think that that's why I get so excited about seeing what you guys are doing. You know, when you look at the guys at Better Agency, what they're doing. We built out our platform on Salesforce. You know, people have different uh, you know opinions of of that one way or the other. But I think that as uh, a community or just the industry, we really start have, having to hold the uh, old guard of technology providers accountable and uh, carriers as well 
to, to keep up with us to be able to continue to push this forward. Because without that, I think it's going to be really hard for us to continue to do and provide the value that we have on the independent side if they're not keeping up with us. Yeah, we're all, uh, everyone's nipping at the data, everyone's nipping at the process, everyone's nipping at little corners of the legacy systems, the legacy carriers. And at some point, the dam's going to break where it's like, cool, yep. we either adapt or we die. And I know that's very cliche, but it's the God honest truth. As the more and more people that keep nipping at these legacy systems, and again, nipping at these legacy carriers, it's gonna, the dam will break for sure. Someone's gonna see the opportunity because as an entrepreneur, I can see it. You know, I can see what's 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 coming and different things that are definitely causing problems. And there's people that are outside of our space that don't understand really the the true reason reasons for why some of these decisions aren't being made. They just don't understand like, well, why doesn't everybody have an API? Do they not know how to, how to create one? I mean, that seems pretty <laughs> simple, but they don't understand all of the you know, legacy, not even just the systems, the, just the, the way of thinking at, at the, uh, you know, especially at the C level um, with some of these carriers and the way that things are, have been done, that until you change that mind, sh shift that mindset and get them to understand the business case for where it is and why it is, and then get the ones that were willing to take the risk of being those first early adopters in certain things, it just, it's not going to, it's not going to go. And we're starting to see that. And I'm sure, Ryan, you probably can speak to that better than any of us. Of how these things go but it, it is a it's a struggle still to get them to you know see where the market was five years ago let alone where it's going to be in 10 years well i mean api is a buzzword right it's no different than va va was the buzzword like two years ago and yet yeah. if you were yeah. going to be in the cool kids club you better be talking about a va and having one and how you use it and then that turned into complaining about vas because nobody had processes to actually teach yeah. the va what to do when they hired them it. and they just did it because everybody else was api is the same way man all these people are throwing around api 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 i love listening to to ryan it's and ragov hilarious. from tarmica talk about like what actually has to happen and like every single yep. individual line of coverage per carrier has its own First api day. Yeah, and it, it just <laughs> by the time you yeah. start looking at all of the crap that goes into that, it, it's yeah. just insane. And I don't look. I'm I'm relatively forward thinking in tech. I had no idea that it was that deep until I heard you guys explain that one time. It's insane, man. We have one carrier. I've talked about them before. I'm going to mention my name. They're a good partner for us, but they have an unlimited tech budget. They have a, an API for every single line of business for every single state for two different systems because they're migrating one to the other. And they each don't talk. So they're all separate. They're all different. They all need different dev. They all need different, uh, you know, specific ways that we integrate with them. They could be shut off at some point. They could be on at some point. It's, it's crazy. The depth of an API is so far beyond what people think it is. They think it's like a, a hotline. Hey, let me call the API hotline and get access. Yeah, like it's, it's, it's the easy button, right? It's the yeah. easy button. Oh, I'll just give the That's API connection it. for that and everything will be taken care of. Yeah. Any uh, yeah. agency owner going into 2022, I, I have one big recommendation. We've got two Gen Zs on our branding team here at Glovebox. Go talk to your Gen Zs, if you know any at all, and talk to them about insurance for 30 Step minutes. Step one, they, meet Gen Z. <laughs> they will blow your mind on what they think about insurance. It's, it's hilarious what they think. I've learned so much from our Gen Zs here in Glovebox. It's been crazy. I was like, wow, you actually do think that. That's insane. Like it's so far beyond what I thought the industry was going to be in 10 years. Talk to them. They'll tell you what the industry yeah. is going to be in 10 years and it'll show you the divide of where we're at right now. It's crazy. Point. Yeah. yeah. So that's good segue, man. Before we wrap up, cause we've been, man, we could go all day. There's yeah. no doubt in my mind. Yeah. What, um, what's on the forefront for glove box in 2022 and what's on the forefront for zip in 2022. And then I want both of you guys to make sure everybody knows how to get a hold of you before we wrap up. Go ahead, Zach. Well, I'll uh, say for us, really, it's focusing on uh, continuing to build out our bond form library. You know, we're going to continue to focus on these different connections. We we're open to connecting with anybody that, you know, it makes business sense to connect to. So uh, we're going to continue to do that. And then hopefully, you know, uh, continue to build out the relationships. We have with agents who really want to partner as, you know, basically a surety division of their agency um, and help, you know, provide different ways of driving revenue and, you know, helping them take stuff off the, the desks of the people in their office that really don't want to do those but that that type of work. Um, cool. Where do they find you, man? I uh, so I actually had my, some of my best conversations in insurance on Twitter. So it's just at Zach Mefford. Um, it's, 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 it's at Zach Mefford. At, it's at Zach dot Mefford. I think it's just Zach Mefford. Z a c h m e f f e r d. Uh, also on LinkedIn, but uh, I'm probably most uh, engaged on Twitter. Are you open to Twitter beef, Zach? Is my question. I, we always ask about cease and desist. <laughs> All right, what do you say? Are you I, I open like to Twitter you. beefs? Yeah, Twitter beefs. There's insurance yeah. Twitter beefs that go on. Oh, I so. know. 
<laughs> I know. They're, they're, I won't name them right now, but if they're listening, they know who they are. There's a couple that I like to get into it with every now and then, and sometimes I have to make sure I take it off and be like, you understand, like, I disagree with you, but I still love you, right? Like, I'm not, you know, and you can always tell it like the Friday or Saturday night, you know, when it's like, uh, you know, how many drinks deep are they right now before they start saying it's what they're, they're actually <laughs> saying? Yeah. Well, we have, yeah. we have a podcaster's thread on Facebook Messenger that's got like me, Scott, Bradley, Cass, Hanley, um, Heath, yes. Sheeran. Like, so we're all like in this deep group going back and forth. There's one particular gentleman that none of them love that apparently, like, I'm not on Twitter at all. I know exactly I, I, I just, who you're talking about, by the way. I'm not going to say this. I, I, I know. I know I? Yeah, I know you guys do. And it just, it blows my mind. I, I'm thinking to myself, it's a really good thing I'm not on Twitter because I'm cut from the cloth that if you said something to me on Twitter, I'm not going to respond to you on Twitter. I'm going to buy a first class ticket up to wherever you live and I'm going to whip that ass. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's yeah, how i think i know what you're talking about i'm not gonna say yeah i'm not gonna say what it is whatnot but i mean it's just every single time you see it, i don't i don't even have to read it yet i can just see the image and i'm like okay i can't wait to see how how we're gonna turn this into something that's not positive or have you you know whatever so it's uh yeah and the thing is i have no beef with that. this person like I've, I've interacted a few times and i've i have had never had a beef don't get me wrong i'm not on twitter but it just seems like it's habitual man so the, the twitter beef is real like it's hilarious that's, that's a real deal man insurance twitter beef like there is rap beefs like it's kind of like the uh, gang fight scene from anchorman right <laughs> yep yeah exactly right. brit kill the guy <laughs> i love it <laughs> I think you should lay low, man. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So uh, what's going on with Glovebox 2022 besides the One City World Tour, which I'm happy to be a part of? Yep, One City World Tour. It, uh, it'll be old news by the time this podcast drops. Man, January 19th, it's already sold out. So if you missed out, you missed out. We'll do it again, hopefully. Uh, getting Bradley and Scott out in the wild is going to be uh, something unique. If you haven't met Scott Howell, uh, he's the Bill Belichick of the uh, insurance business. He wears no sleeves ever. So I'm looking forward to seeing him sleeveless in Dan uh, Denver in January. So that'll be good. But uh, no, man, Glovebox, we're honestly, we're a duck on the pond right now. You, you see, you know, where, where we're at right now, people have no idea what we're creating underneath the, the water. Uh, we've got, I'm up to 13 developers now that are spinning up some crazy, can I curse on this crazy shit? Um, yeah, yeah, we are creating some crazy shit right now um we're finally launching commercial in q1 uh which is going to be amazing uh i'm not going to talk about the rest but we are creating some cool stuff man we we are firm believers in glovebox can be an ecosystem that brings the carriers and the agent closer to the client than ever before and so we're going to be open api at some point we're going to allow you know and, and work with people like you zach to bring in your capabilities and let agents really customize the experience that they want to bring to their clients we're not we're not selfish. I don't want to build it if I can partner on it. Um, but Great. our ecosystem is going to grow significantly in 2022. You guys are going to see uh, really what we've been creating in our minds for a while. It's going to come to fruition, which we're excited about. So, Love it. Can't wait to see well, that uh, open Yeah, up. that's the whole thing that's crazy, man, is because people are going to look at what you've done right now and be like, wow, these guys are really revolutionary. But you're literally seeing like the tip of the pinky finger at this yeah. point. It's not anything close and i mean i'm certainly not privy to everything you're doing behind the scenes i know things that we've talked about on you know offline before that you have, have said were coming up and i mean that alone it, it i just really really wish and i mean this sincerely i really wish that my peer group adopted technology much better than what they do i've, I've been saying this for years now we have adopters, we have adapters, and we have do-nothings. The adopters are the people who are they're, – they're me, man. I'll, I'll take whatever opportunity I think I see. I'll seize it. If I don't – if it's not going to work, I'll cut bait and move on, but I'll never miss an opportunity because I'm always quick to jump. Adapters are the people who waited until after COVID already hit but realized they probably needed to go ahead and get a webcam, and then they went to Amazon. It was gone. Yeah. And then the do-nothings just did nothing. They just locked the front door and hoped for the best. You yeah. know. And I think that that's – sad for our industry because i feel like the people who do absolutely nothing are the overwhelming majority yeah you still have filing cabinets you know it, here's here's the thing most of our peer most of my peer group like the people that i hang with the closest we can't even comprehend that an agency runs in 2021 with no agency management system you're not if there's a ton of them out there if you're not in business if you don't have an ams system period that's like our first conversation or a crm you know and be, be able to have them talk to each other that would be uh 
That'd be too much to ask for, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like the that's like the arms race right now. Whoever can come out with that. I mean, I think. Say what you want about agency Zoom. You know, I, I know that there are people on both sides of the fence. I'm agnostic. I don't. I don't have any beef. We've had Cat on the podcast. I, I think that by Vertifor making that decision and that acquisition, that put them in the in the front runner's seat, in my opinion, to be the first one to hit it. And you guys know I'm an investor in Better Agency. Yeah. But I feel I, I, Better Agency doesn't have the capital Vertifor has. Yep. Right. And so. Not yet. Well, yeah, not yet, but it's, I, it's, I'm capital, really... it's capital versus speed to market. And I think that's what better agency has an advantage at is they they have speed to market. Um, well, I also think that they do a really good job of asking questions of people that actually sit in the shoes doing the, the actual work. And I can't speak to anything specifically to the agency Zoom. that I don't know much about that, but that's one of the approaches uh, that I really appreciate about what they, they've done. And I think, again, you talk about the arms race. Well, it depends on what you mean by it got there, you know? Uh, is there a company that has an AMS with a CRM connected to it? Well, yeah, they're, that, they're that there right exists. now. By all accounts, people probably thought that Epic with the Salesforce integration was going to happen. And everybody I've talked to that tried to do that said it's an absolute disaster. We tried to do it with AMS 360 well, at our agency, and it was a disaster. So We actually spent a day and a half at Applied Systems trying to talk about how, when they initially uh, purchased uh, Techinary, on how we could make that work and, and try to figure that out. And I, I, that's a, I could do a whole podcast on that experience. But... So what does that mean, though? And I think, again, it's what Ryan said. We, we need to be able to give agencies uh, it, the tools to be able to do business in a way that they want to be able to do it so that their agency to customize to what they want. That's the beauty of our space. You can do things so much so much differently, and they all still yeah. work. But our technology needs to be able to allow us to tailor how we do things uh, on that side as well. Just know that what we're creating is um, what we feel like is a better way to do business in the independent channel. We are truly merging the direct to consumer technologies with the independent channel capabilities into a single ecosystem. And we firmly believe there's a better way to do business and that's what we're putting out. So 2022 is going to be a big year for us. Well, I think what I appreciate the most about you guys is the fact that you collaborate with other people in tech now in insure tech, right? You're not going to try and be all things to all people. And I equate that in my own experience to the guys that are DOD contractors that manufacture flight simulators, for example. You've got 10 different vendors that are all bidding on the same contract. It's awarded to one of them as the general, and then they immediately go back and hire the other nine to do what their area of expertise is in the general project. So you're kind of competitors, but you're not really because you're all going to get a piece of the pie. It's just who's going to get the biggest piece of the pie. My comments about Vertifor and um, Agency Zoom have absolutely nothing to do with who I think is working harder and working smarter and all of that. It has everything to do with the fact they have unlimited money right now. I yeah. hope, you know, my, my, who I'm pulling for is better agency a hundred percent for both financial and sentimental reasons. I mean, I really like the people that started the company and are running it and I invested money into it. So I obviously want to see them succeed and I hope that they can get there. I think that what they do, that's a blessing in terms of listening to everybody can also be a curse because when you listen to everybody, everybody expects you to take action on that. Yep. And as a startup, you know, and, and technically they're still a startup, you know, they, they can't go every single different direction just because somebody told them to jump and that, that makes a PR nightmare. And just that, that's true. But how many times do technology people come in from outside of the space and try to fix it from a technology side in instead of from an agency side? Out? I agree. That's all yeah, I meant. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. Have to, you have to know the problem, and, and, you know, the everyday problems as it sits, you know, at this desk, you know, writing insurance. Like, that's what so many technology companies have failed to do is understand actually what it's like to, you know, uh, sell insurance. Well, there's or, people or inside the space that don't understand what it takes to sell insurance. That's so. true. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I agree with Zach. I mean, the fact that they have their user group, their Facebook user group, I'm in there. Yep. Um, I don't ever really get involved on anything unless I'm tagged with a question or whatever. But I do watch. And I mean, very, very active in, you know, completely transparent in how they do that. So if they can... If they can maintain that code of conduct, they're going to be just fine because yeah, they're always going to have a happy constituency. There's a segment of the market for everyone, and that's the important part to know. Like we don't, we're not looking to get 100% of the market. 95% is fine. Um, <laughs> we're not looking to get 100. <laughs> just know that we've got we've got some really exciting stuff coming in 2022. We're excited to announce it. We're very focused on feature sets in 2022. This year has been all about infrastructure for us. We built a lot of back end that people have not seen. Now yeah. we're really setting the table to explode on our feature sets in 2022. So it's, it's going to be exciting. And at the foundation though, before you can make it. We have know, built uh, a very painfully 
thought out process of back end infrastructure this year and it is beautiful, <laughs> but nobody sees it. You haven't seen it yet. Same. <laughs> I feel your pain. I mean, not to your level, but I definitely understand yeah. what that's like. Well, cool deal. Listen, guys, I got to wrap up because I got a one o'clock. I got to jump on. I appreciate you coming on. So everybody who is listening to this, have a great week. See ya. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com. <laughs>